So today we want to, the title for the message today is Come to the Table. Yeah, come to the table. And what table is this? You know, sometimes we all heard, or rather, at one point or, some, or another, we read the scripture, the God say, you know, I'll prepare a table before your enemy. So today we want to explore really what does it mean to come to the table. I believe this is a very powerful uh, concept. If you grasp the understanding of this concept, you will find yourself unrattled by your environment. You find yourself sitting in perfect peace, notwithstanding any situation that you go through. Amen? And so let's begin today's uh, session with First King. First King chapter 10, verse 1 to 5. First King chapter 10, verse 1 to 5. We have that? Yes? No? Huh? Okay, never mind. We just go to First King chapter 10, verse 5. This is a situation where the Queen of Sheba has heard about King Solomon. Yeah. Chapter what chapter 10, verse 1 to 5. Yeah. So so when, when Solomon's wisdom was being spread out throughout the region, one of the things that captured the attention was the Queen of Sheba. And she was, that means this is the area in Ethiopia. And she was very impressed with Solomon's wisdom. And, and for all that she heard, she purposely go all the way to, to Jerusalem. So he said, now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She came to test him with hard question, you know, because every time when, when you find that when God lift up and exalt the person, there will be people who want to test whether if God is real. And that's normal. In fact, it's good. That means they're interested in what God is doing. So she came to Jerusalem with great retinue. Well, the word retinue, yeah? And, 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 and retinue means great company, yeah? With camels that bought spices, very much gold, precious stone when he came to Solomon. Every time you see and anybody come to worship God, it's always with bearing the gift that's always significant. Not wood, hay, and straw, aluminum, but rather gold, silver, precious stone. This speaks of the characteristic of God. You find that in the new Jerusalem, there's only gold, there's only pearl and precious stone. There's no silver, there's no other material. In, in the new Jerusalem, this tells us that in the kingdom of God, the thing that will eventually stay are the thing that's of gold, that is of pearl, that is of precious stone. And interestingly, in the new Jerusalem, there's no silver because silver is for the work of redemption and redemption is over. So when the new Jerusalem comes down, it is only gold, Precious stone and pearl. And the pearl is really huge. One big gate that's pearl. So whatever pearl you have today, you can throw away when Jesus comes back. Yeah? So in short, don't buy pearl. <laughs> it will be useless. But it's okay to have pearl in. Yeah. So he says that. So she, so she spoke very much. She spoke with him about all that was in the heart. Welcome, the divine family. So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king. The Bible said nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba has seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house he has built, the food on his table, the sitting of his servant, the service of his waiter and their apparel, cup bearer, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. That means she was flawed. In today's language means when she saw the opulence, when she saw the glory, when she saw the wisdom of someone that has established, you find, when with wisdom, it comes with a lot of good blessing. Wisdom is not something that sounds nice. Wisdom is not something to solve our problem, but wisdom actually order our life in such a way where you find that from, from a country where it is used to go through the desert where a country trying to survive, a group of people that's trying to survive the desert today through the wisdom of God. Israel is established. This, in fact, is the apex or you like the apogee of Israel. That means this is Israel at its best. During the reign of Solomon, because of the wisdom that he possessed, Israel was at its best. And this is something very significant. That means every time when you walk in the wisdom of God, you find actually your life will be at your best. When the children of Israel was going through the desert, they were struggling. They were chased after by the enemy. They were being, you know, the enemy literally were about to wipe them out. They are just surviving hand to mouth. But when God poured upon his wisdom upon this person called Solomon, through the wisdom of God, Solomon established Jerusalem in his what we call the Haitian day. That means, that means Jerusalem was at its best 
under the reign of Solomon. And this is a picture of the new Jerusalem prophetically. This picture is a foreshadow of how the new Jerusalem will look like, where God has actually quelched all his enemies as, as sub has overrun all his enemy and the only thing that had left is people coming to pay homage to God. People come to be to just gaze at the glory, at the splendor of Jerusalem. Let me tell you guys, if you begin to grow in the wisdom of God, you will find God will begin to establish your life. All those trouble that you used to have, all the things that used to pursue you, that used to hound you like a werewolf, like a wolf, Hungry for your life, you find that you will reign over them. This is something that, that's why the Bible says that wisdom is supreme. It's the principal thing. Get wisdom. That, that is Proverbs 4, 7. Yeah, and, and we, 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 have, we have been doing this verse for quite a long time. Said, in all you're getting, get understanding. That's why I want us, I want you to be impressed in the spirit that in the reign of Solomon, the one thing that set him apart the one thing that established Jerusalem to be at its best, where Jerusalem is in its full glory and splendor, is this thing that established Solomon called wisdom and understanding. And he asked for it because when God appeared to Solomon and said, what would you like to have? Solomon did not ask for anything else. He said, give me understanding and wisdom that I may lead these great people of yours. And because of this asking, God said, because you only ask for wisdom, I will add on to you riches. I will add on to you wealth. And so because of that, this is a beautiful picture of how a nation can be escorted at its height of splendor and glory because the king possessed the wisdom of God. And likewise, when you possess the wisdom of God, you are the king of your life, so to speak. Of course, Jesus is the big king. You are the small king. And when you become possess or rather when wisdom begins to lead you in your life you find yourself on surviving in the desert you will find yourself slowly you build yourself up into a place where there is strength into a place where it's no longer trying to survive but now you actually reigning in power if you believe say amen yeah, this is something that you can possess. I want to encourage you so that your faith is not just flimsy, just trying to survive. A lot of people for the longest time thinking that Christianity is just to survive until Jesus comes back. You know, so you have this picture of us, wow, you know, and the gates of hell will not prevail. It's like hell is bursting through the seam and we are just barely closing the... We just change that picture. When the Bible says, you shall, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. That means the gates of hell can't even stand the church. Not the church just trying to stop the gates of hell prevailing. The picture is reversed. We have to readjust our picture. This is what it looks like in 1 King 10, 1-5. That when wisdom prevail, when, when there is wisdom found in the house of God, the, the house is established firmly in a powerful place. So let's go back to 1 King 1-5. And, and when, when, when Sheba came, she was totally impressed. She said there was no more spirit in her. That means she was totally speechless. In fact, she said that whatever I heard of you, not even 50% is true. There are more than what it is. That means, wow, you know, she was completely bowed over, bowled over by Solomon. And the Bible says that when she came in, when the Queen of Sheba has seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he has built, that means the wisdom will help you to build the house. Amen? And the food on his table, sitting of his servant, service of his waiter. That means every there is fantastic system. There is structure in the house of God. There is glory. There's resplendent. There's splendor in the house of God. That means one minute, let me say one more time. When you have wisdom in your, in your life, this is God, what God will establish you. That means not only there's system in your life, but God eventually will shift you from just hand to mouth to glory. Amen? It don't happen overnight, but it will take time. Israel was just a people that's trying to survive the onslaught of his enemy not too long ago. But by the time he reaches Solomon, she is firmly established as a nation so powerful that around the region they came and paid homage to this beautiful city. And so today, I want you to focus on one thing. Say, when, when, when the queen came, she saw the food on his table. The food on his table. Today, the message is come to the table. If you remember in 2 Samuel chapter 9, when Mephibosheth was being called into the palace. You know, Mephibosheth is the grandson of King Saul, 
the son of Jonathan, who at the age when he was a boy, he, the mate brought, uh, took him to escape the war. And as a result, you know, they dropped him like a nankabusu. And then he was crippled because the leg was injured. And then he was lame from there. And then by the time one day in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, David was just having his reign. And then he think, hey, who in the house of Saul can I bless? Yeah, and then Ziba came and said, "Yeah, there's one more, one more chap, little boy. This guy called Mephibosheth, li living in Lodiba. Let's get him back." And you find that every time when God finds us, we are always in a bad spot. You know, we're in Lodiba. Lodiba means no pasture. It is a bad place. And so when when the news get to get to Mephibosheth, that means Mephibosheth did not enjoy the blessing of the, of the palace because she did not hear about the intention of the king. So David said, hey, is there anyone left that I can actually bless him to show kindness for Jonathan's sake? That means if nobody could locate Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth would continue to live in a desperate condition. Think about this. That means the king's intention was to bless Mephibosheth. But if you didn't receive this good news, you will be living, continuous to live in this abject condition. Same thing today. If today God wants to bless you, He said that, hey, I sit you on the heavenly throne in the heavenly place in, with Christ Jesus. It's a position of authority. That means you don't even have to just always pray to me for help. You yourself can chase the enemy. But if you never hear of this good news, then you always be consistently living in fear, living in this demoralization, living in disappointment, living in discouragement, and thinking for your whole life will be like that. So that means whatever that David intend to bless Jonathan, sorry, Matthew Boshev, that news must get to him. Somebody must bring the news to him. Today, some of your friends are like Mephibosheth. They're living in abject poverty. They're struggling in life. They're trying to, try to overcome the situation. They're surrounded by situations that is beyond them. That's why people have depression. Why? Because I can't handle it. Depression is a result of us being overwhelmed in life. And I don't have the resources. I feel that I don't have the resources to overcome. And unfortunately, this includes Christian. That means the reason why they're in depression is because of the lack of knowledge. You see, people die for the lack of knowledge. That means they do not know that they're seated in the heavenly place. So today, they're still trying to make sense, trying to survive Lodiba. Unless the good news get to you, unless they're informed of David's intention to bless you, you will be living in Lodiba for the rest of your life. Even though it is God's intention to bring you into the palace. That means your job today, Part of your job is to go find Mephibosheth. Some of your friends are like Mephibosheth. They are living in the situation where it's just hand to mouth. They are just surviving. Now, unless you bear the goodness and say, hey, you don't have to live your life like this. There are ways to change. Things can get better. Get to know the king. If you get in touch with David, he can make your life different. He will bring you into the palace. And so in verse 11, in verse 11, Ziba finally reported to David. She went to do his homework, located Mephibosheth without LinkedIn, without Instagram, without Facebook. He managed to locate him. And he says, Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, says, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's son. He shall eat at my table. Today, God is inviting you to his table. But many of us are too busy. <laughs> we got no time, you know. You know, you know, Lord, you know, I got so many things to do. And sometimes it is work that keep us from the table. Sometimes it's challenges that keep us from the table. How many know that when you don't have the right frame of mind, you're not in the mood to go to the table, right? If you're under stress, if you're under pressure surrounding, if the Lord says, come to my table, you will be so, you know, you're not in the right frame of mind. Is this a relating one come in, one go out? Yeah. If you're not in the right frame of mind, you, you find that even when God invites you to the table, you, you're, not in the, you're not in the mood. That means you, you, even if you're at the table, but you're not able actually to feast at the table. There is a verse in Psalms, uh, Joshua, it's over at your left side. Yeah, you go to the wrong place over this. Yeah. In Psalms 23, verse 5, the Bible says, and, and the Lord and the king, what? 
Psalms 23 verse 5 is okay. If you don't have it, it's okay. Let's go to Psalms 23 verse 5. In Psalms 23 verse 5, he says, He will prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Wow, this is powerful. That's verse 5. He says, that, he says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. That means, guys, when it is a beautiful statement that God prepare a table in the presence of your enemy. That means most people will lose appetite when they are surrounded by enemy. True? Right? Most of the time, how many of you all go to the Word of God the first thing when in trouble? Nah. <laughs> when you are stressed, your average Christian, 9 out of 10, when you are under stress, the last thing you do is to read the Bible. Because you just don't have the frame of mind. Because, you know, you are already so under pressure and you find yourself going through the Word of God is just mere words. Right? And this is exactly one of the wows and the schemes of the enemy to put you in the situation where you lose your appetite in front of your enemy. But the Lord say, I will prepare, or as the Nigerians say, I will prepare a table for you. Oh, by the way, next week we have a Nigerian preacher coming. Yeah, the real Nigerian preacher. He said, I'll prepare a table before you in the presence of my enemy. Yeah, and so that means God will set you in the place where you lose appetite. God said, I'll prepare a table for you. Now, this is a very powerful concept because right at the table is where the food are. Right at the table is where you're supposed to partake of the food of God. And he said that when you are in the presence of your enemy, where you, where you lose every appetite, God said, hey, hang on, come first to the table. Because unless you eat from my table, you will not be able to face your enemy. So in the contra on the contrary, instead of us losing appetite when I'm surrounded by enemy, now I should go by faith in the presence of my enemy where I already lose focus, where I'm under stress, where my heart is heavy, where I feel defeated. You know, when you feel defeated, discouraged, you lose appetite. So in short, the, but the Bible says the just shall live by what? By feeling, by faith, right? That means I put aside my feeling, I put aside my emotion because if you are led by emotion, you will never be able to get to the table. Even if you get to the table, you look at the food, also you got no appetite. And this is one of the schemes of the enemy to make sure that you are so locked into the environment, to the storm, that you come to the table, also you got no appetite. I, this used to happen to me as a young Christian when I'm under stress. I try to open the Bible. Hey, you know, you just find that, you know, you can't read out if you're reading, but you, nothing gets into your head. You know, if you're reading, you find nothing registered in your spirit. You're just going through words after words after words. And this is the first level where the enemy has already ensnared you. So one of the things is that if you under peace during the time of peace, you are regularly, you, are de you have developed the habit of going to the king's table to feast with him. Mephibosheth was invited to sit at the king's table. That means he was from Lodiba, where he was just scraping, eating from the bottom of the barrel, so to speak. And now he's brought to the king's table. That means he has to adjust his mindset that now every day, I have to be at the king's table. That means I no longer have to keep eat the leftover but I must feel comfortable to be at the king's table and eat with him. And this is important because at the table is where you will find resources to overcome your enemy. That's why Jesus said, I will prepare, the Lord said, Yahweh said, I will prepare a table for you before your enemies. That means right before your enemy, you're going to eat before them. And this takes courage, this takes wisdom, this takes right positioning. That means you have the right spiritual posture. In the book of Mark chapter 7, we all are familiar with this story of the Syrophoenician woman. We have read this story before. He said, Then from there he arose and went to the region of Tar and Sidon, and they entered a house and wanted no one to know, but he could not be hidden. You know, when Jesus everywhere he go, because of the works that Jesus is doing, he cannot be hidden. Everywhere he go, people heard about him. Yeah. Same for you. If, if you are doing miracles, signs and wonder, when you're moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, everywhere you go, people will take notice of you and people will seek after you. And actually, this is the work of what 
a disciple witness. That's how you witness. That means you don't have to chase people. People will be attracted to you if you are growing the right way. If you agree, say amen. That means you don't literally, that's why God said, go and be a witness. Go and be a witness because if your life, you develop your life in such a way where your life is overrunning with the goodness of God. Demonstration of the power of God. Demonstration of His presence. You find that people will be drawn to you. And so Jesus, the Bible says He could not be hidden. Say, for a woman with whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about Him and she came and fell at His feet. The woman was a Greek, Syrophoenician by birth and she kept asking to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Uh, we have been through this particular story before. Jesus said that, why should we take the bread for the children and throw it to the dog? So I want you to notice something. This bread is directly in, in direct address to this lady whose daughter has been surrounded. The Bible says whose daughter had an unclean spirit. That means this bread is not just for healing, but it is actually to restore you spiritually also. And so at the table is where the bread is. And, and of course, Jesus said, why should I take the, the bread that belongs to children and feed to the dog? Yeah, and she said that, yeah, but you know, even this lot, but yet even the little dogs eat under the table uh, from the children's crumb. So the lady, we have went through this before, the lady understand that even though she was not part of the Jews as a Gentile, she said, even if I don't eat the bread, I can eat the crumbs. So even the crumbs has got healing power. Amen. So at the table is where the bread is. And this bread, the Bible says, this is the bread where the Lord say, give us this day our daily bread. Most of us understand it as supply. God supply me so that I got bread to supper. You know what I mean? I have got food to eat. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, that, so that there's food for me. But this is not what it meant. If you look at scripture, to compare scripture, the Bible says at the table, there is bread that is meant for healing. That means this healing is in fact specifically in this instant to the situation of an unclean spirit that's beseech the person. Let me tell you something. A lot of us, have a very different or sometimes an incomplete idea about spiritual issue. Let me say something that may shock you. You'll find actually every day you are actually tempted and you are actually, you find actually the enemy works in you more often than you think. That's why the Lord said, give us this day our daily bread. You need it daily because you need this bread actually to fortify yourself. It is not once, you know, give us this day our monthly bread. Most of us have our monthly bread, weekly bread, quarterly bread, you know what I mean? But not daily bread. <laughs> and then by the time you need the bread, you got no mood to read. When you got mood to read, you got no time. Got time but no bread. Got bread but no time. So you have situation of Christian, when they are feeling happy, they got no appetite to eat also. They are feeling dejected, also got no appetite to read. When you are in love, you, you got time to read the Bible. Right, all the time your mind, or if you are doing a business deal that will cost you, it will bring you a six mil, uh, six figure commission. You are so overjoyed, you got no time for the bread of God. That means you find in either situation, either you're in a situation where you are so much stress that you lose appetite, or you got so much blessing that you also lose appetite. That is why the Bible says the thorn and thistles in Matthew chapter 13. It said the thorn and thistle will choke the word. The thorn and thistle represents the worries in life and the pleasure and the deceitfulness of wealth. Both can choke. So the devil, see, don't, don't think that because you are blessed or miss, God is working in your life. You may have to reread the Bible. The Bible talks about deceitfulness of wealth. That means wealth do not necessarily sometimes to come from God. The world has plenty of it. The world will offer you wealth. But the wise believer, when they, are, when they have take a portion of wealth on the world, they know how to manage it well. That's the difference. Yeah? God, God uh, we used to say this before, in the kingdom of God, if we, whatever you take from the world, and if you know how to sow into the kingdom of God, that is the biggest money laundering. The original money laundering. That means you take what that is dirty and then you convert into something that's good. Amen? The Bible says, when you do this, when you, when you give a water to one of my least of my people, you have done it for me. Lord, when do we see you naked and clothed you? When do you see you hungry and feed you? When do you see thirsty and leave you? Or oh, whatever you have done for the least of my people. 
you have done it for me. That means what you have done is to take what is mammon that is filthy in the world and then you convert it into the kingdom of God. This is the original money laundering. Amen. So, so the Bible says that when you come to the table, yeah, the bread is for supposed to be for you. What, what does that mean? That means every day this bread that you partake is to help you to handle every temptation from the enemy. It's a daily thing. That is why you find sometimes yourself far away from God. You find yourself distanced from the Lord. It's because instead of give us this day our daily bread, some of us make it this, give us this day our quarterly bread. That means we read the word of God every quarter. Yep. Sometimes you don't read every quarter, you read, give us this day our monthly bread. It's daily. The reason why it's daily, because every day you are surrounded by an enemy that walk unceasingly after you. But the good news is you have a Holy Spirit that operate in you 24-7 also. Amen. And this enemy will not have any. That means his wows. Can we, I didn't give this to you, Joey, but let me go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Paul warned the people in Corinth. He said, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. There are the enemy's devices, and where does the devices work all the time? It's always in your head. Every time when the enemy exerts his devices, his schemes, deception, and his, and his uh, strategies, is all geared towards your head and your heart. Both are almost synonymous. And so the only way actually you find, for example, yesterday if you happen to lose your cool, actually you have chosen the way of the enemy. If you think of a thought that's not so good and decide to want to almost tempted to do it, actually you have been seduced by the enemy. If you lose your cool over somebody who's just happened to be in front of you and then you, you know, you, you begin to want to retell it, actually you have chosen to eat from the enemy. Actually, that means we should not get we should not get overwhelmed by the fact that the enemy surround us, but we just need to be informed so that it draws us every day to the table and partake of the bread. Amen. That means our job is not to get obsessed and get fearful because you think enemy is everywhere, but rather we need to develop the awareness that the enemy works unceasingly. But thank God we have a Holy Spirit that also dwells in us unceasingly, 24-7, including the leap year also. Amen? So even 29th Feb, Holy Spirit never take off his day also. Amen? And so therefore, he works unceasingly 24-7 for you so that when you are instructed by the bread, when you have eaten and partake the bread, this bread is meant to protect you from your mind, from this unclean spirit that surrounds us. I am very certain if God opened our eyes, we will be quite amazed at the amount of the enemy that's around us. But yet, remember the picture I showed us quite a while ago, the shark that swim, and then you're surrounded by thousands of small little fish. This is us. All these demons are all the little fish that are trying to disturb us. But we are the, we, we are the boss. Small boss, of course. We are the small big boss. That means we should walk around that means we should not be sweating. We should let the enemy sweat. Because the Bible says if one of us can put a thousand, two of us can put ten thousand to flight. Hey, this is this this is extrapolation. This this is exponential. One can put one thousand, two can put ten thousand. This is the place, the authority that we are seated. That means the more I eat the bread of God, the more I am informed of my position. The more I eat the bread of God, the more I grow spiritually in understanding, in depth, in length, and breadth, and height of the position that we are in. Because there is no way you can go against the enemy when you are clueless of your position. That's why but people perish for the lack of knowledge. Because you just treat the word of God lightly. When you treat the word of God lightly, that is why when the enemy surrounds you, you only thing you know what to do is please pray for me. Yeah, Christian favorite activity, please pray for me. There's nothing wrong with that. We all need prayer. Sometimes I also need prayer. But, but what I'm saying is that beyond just please pray for me, what about us instructed by, instruct by the word of God? Give us this day our daily bread. That means this is a daily exercise where since I am the Mephibosheth that's invited to the king's table, where I'm invited to sit daily at his table, let me make it a habit where I daily have time 
to feast with Him and take this bread where the Bible says this bread will take care of the spiritual enemy that's surrounding us. Because every day you find yourself battling in and out, to and fro between thoughts. You find actually every day your battle is just in thoughts. You are either battling with, that's why the Bible says in the, uh, Romans 8, 6, that says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That means all the enemy need to do is just to lead you to be carnally minded. That's all he need to do. All his schemes, all his strategies, all his deception is just to lead you to take this position where you are carnally minded. And to be carnally minded means you begin to walk in the flesh. That means everything you see, people, you judge people. You say, oh, this guy is this and, and you want to retaliate. And this guy do this to me. I'll, I'll return an eye for an eye. This guy, I'll remember what he done to me. You do this to me, I'll make sure I get you back. All these are being carnally minded. Or being calculative. Oh, because you do this to me, you never buy me lunch the last time. Why should I buy you lunch? You know, you know we, 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 any kind of thoughts that is in this mode that is carnally minded brings to death. And let me tell you something. Every believer has a potential to be carnally minded. Every believer. That means it's a choice. That's why Paul said to be carnally minded. It's a choice to be spiritually minded. It's a choice. If you find yourself in a bad situation, chances are if you look back, that means you go back your reference the last few days, your chances are you're carnally minded. If you find yourself in a position of stress, in a spot of duress, in a spot of disappointment, in a spot of anger, steaming and seize and, and, and soaking in, in, in despair and anger, that means the last few days, your last few weeks, you have been carnally minded. And this is lack of eating at the table because you went out and stayed at Lodiba. That means you are supposed to stay in the king's palace, but you're so used to staying at Lodiba. At night, quietly, you bring yourself out to Lodiba. And that is why when the minute you're in Lodiba, you find yourself back to square one. God is good, but life sucks. Right? This is the reality for most Christians. But guess what? The position of us in the New Testament, whether we are in the palace or whether we are back to Lodiba, is a state of mind. That means it depends how I am feeding myself spiritually. One of the reasons to feed ourselves spiritually is so that we can be firmly planted in the truth, in biblical truth, that God has raised us up and seated us in Christ in the heavenly place. This is our position. This is the king's presence, sitting daily at the king's table. Ephesians 2.6 gives us the reality of, of 2 Samuel 9.11, where Mephibosheth is invited to sit at the king's table. This reality is corroborated in Ephesians 2.6, where he says that God has raised us up and seated us in Christ Jesus in the heavenly realm. Right? Now, what does that mean? That means this is a position of power. That means this is a position where if I am aware, if I grow in awareness of this truth, I will develop a mindset where there is spiritually minded. That means in, it is only in this position, a mindfulness and awareness of this position and experientially through the Word of God, through meditating and being aware, locking the Holy Spirit, that now you are making this a reality. So physically you're on earth, but spiritually you're seated there. Okay, thank you for your enthusiasm. Let me repeat more about that. That means physically you're on earth, but spiritually you're located there. That means what does that mean? That means the enemy cannot reach you. Because why the Bible says, and God has raised him up far above. Can we go to Ephesians 1 21 for the sake of reinforcing to you? I think it's 20 or 21, where the Bible says, and God raised him up far above every principality, dominion, power, and might. That means, yes, and 21, sorry. That he raised him up from the dead and seated him at his right hand, right hand of the Father. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. We are seated in Christ. That means same position, right? Far above what? Principality, power, might, and dominion. That means this is our position where we are above the enemy. That means the enemy should not locate us if only if you remain in this position. But actually, spiritually, we can actually dethrone ourselves from that position when we become carnally minded. The minute you become carnally minded, you get yourself out of that position. Then you say, wow, the enemy is very powerful. No, you shift that position. 
in the realm of the spirit is all about spiritual positioning. Your spiritual positioning will determine your experience in your life. That means both persons can go through experience. The disciple go to the storm in the boat. Jesus was in the boat, go to the storm. The disciple was panicking. Jesus was sleeping. Why? Because his spiritual position is different. So it doesn't mean that if you are a Christian, you will be exempted from storm. No, no, no. You will have storm, but you are exempted from the stress. Amen. That means if you choose, this is a choice. Choose this day. Can we give a reminder to our congregation, Deuteronomy 30 verse 19? It says, I call heaven and earth to bear witness to you, as a witness to you, that today, choose this day, whether life or death, blessing or curses. Amen? Uh, Deuteronomy 30 19. So God said, it's a choice. Even though I bless you already, even though I have already given you my blessing, you are supposed but no, 3019, not 139. 301. So it says that choose this day. I call heaven and earth to be a witness against you today. Why? I said before you life and death. That means it's a choice. Even though Jesus is our living bread, it is a choice. Because if I choose to be carnally minded, if I'm tempted by the enemy to behave carnally minded, that means to think natural, I have fallen in, I have dethroned myself by Ephesians 2.6. That is why some people say, hi, this reality all just talk, 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 only it just sounds good, but in reality it don't happen because every day I'm still in Lodiba. Because if you don't guard your mind, you will actually, took, you will be just, hey, Adam and Eve were supposed to be in Eden. How did they get out of Eden the next day? Because of the choice. Amen. They chose the wrong tree. They were supposed to be in Eden where there's plenty of provision. There the presence of God is. But they took the wrong choice. Next thing. Oh. That means your, your, where you are today is determined by the choice you make every day. The choice you make every day depends how much you're eating at the table. If you come to the table and fall asleep and use your handphone, Instead of eating with the Lord, then you find yourself, even you go to the table, you, you, you get nothing. But if you go to the table and every day, Lord, feed me, fill my mind. Let this bread, let us partake of this bread. There is a verse in uh, John chapter 6, verse 32, I believe. John 6, 32. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Yeah? So the, and the people said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Amen? And he who comes to me shall never hunger, but he who believes in me shall never thirst. He is the bread of life. This is the bread that's found on the table where Jesus said, why should we give bread to the dogs? This is the bread that healed the unclean spirit of the lady, of a, of a daughter. So every day when you come to the king's table, you are supposed to partake of this living bread. Amen. Psalm 78 verse 24, 25. I said, I've said this a couple of years back. I have not said this verse for a long time. The Bible says that in the desert, God rained down manna for them to eat, for the children of Israel when they are going through the desert, and given them the bread of heaven. And they said, man eats angels' food, and he sent them food to the food. That means the bread, the manna that they went out to collect every day are angels' food. Hallelujah. That means they are food for champion. Some versions say these are food for champion. That means this bread that comes down from heaven is a prophetic picture of Jesus, the bread from heaven. And every day when they partake of it, even to the point where they get so tired, they complain. And actually, this is a scenario of many, many believers today. They eat the bread of God. I just Bible only. Aye, every day read the Bible is so boring. Because your eyes are not open. You don't know what you're eating. The Bible says they eat angels' food. They eat food for champion. That means it is through eating of this food that you take down giant. Not Milo. What other, what, other, what, other, what, other, what other milk they promote that makes you supposed to be strong? Yeah. Any of those milk promoted from the advertisement are wrong one. Okay? This is a bread that the Bible says, and they ate angels' food. That means the very bread that rains down from heaven, which is a picture of the living bread from heaven, which is Christ. 
In the Old Testament, this is a picture of Jesus coming down every day where they're supposed to go outside and fetch the bread. So that this is their daily bread. That means you have to go out and fetch. That means every day, unless you already predetermined, you already set aside time to sit at the king's table. But if you only think that whatever time I have, I will sit at the king's table, you will never have time. That means if sitting at the king's table is not part of your schedule, if you don't prioritize it, and you only do it at the whatever balance you have for the day, you'll never do it. That's what Christians do. That means I only have time if I have balanced time. But if you say every day, before I go to work, no matter how busy, how many of you ever skip brushing your teeth because you're so busy? I know some people do, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Shouldn't. Yeah. Because if it's okay, you live in the cave. But you live with people, you open your mouth, people fall under the anointing. But this is a different anointing, you know. Ah. Yeah. Why, why is that every day, there's, even though despite, no matter how busy we are, we have time to shower, we have time to go to the washroom, we have time to brush our teeth, we have time for food. Why? Because this is really locked in, really. Well, lock in the time at the table as one of the activities. Because if you don't lock in, you will never have time. If your thinking is that whatever time I have, whatever time at the end of the day I have, I'll, I'll go to the Word of God. You will never have time. But if every day you say, no matter how busy, if I schedule, if tomorrow I'm not going to start at 6 o'clock, if you say, you know what, I'm going to wake up at 5.30. <gasps> Unthinkable for some of you, right? <sighs> but if you seek if as His kingdom and His righteousness, the Bible says all oh, these things will be added unto you. Give us this day our daily bread because this is the bread that will cause you to overcome your enemy. This is food, for angels' food. That means food for overcomer. There is a version that says this is food for champion. The, 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 the Hebrew scholars say this are food for champion. That means if you eat this, unless you want to overcome your, your enemy, you see, every day is either you overcome your enemy or your enemy overcome you. Actually, there's no middle ground. Just that sometimes you're overcome, you do not know. God make us more than overcome or not more than overcame. Many a time, we are more than overcame. Alama. <laughs> no, no, you're supposed to be more than overcome. But you see, even though that's a promise, but the precondition is that you must come to the king's table. Amen. When you come to the king's table, whatever food, the bread that you partake will actually going to energize you. Oh, not only is going to energize you, it's going to open your eyes. When you come to the king's table, listen to this, this is a very important principle. When you come to the king's table and as you begin to partake, of the now initially when you come, you find you read nothing but just mere information. But there's going to come a tipping point where one day you come to the king's table, suddenly the, the word began to unfold. When the word unfold, according to Psalms 119, 130, he said the unfolding of the words gives light. When the word of God began to unfold, when you begin to possess wisdom and understanding, every, as we mentioned before, every wisdom and understanding that you possess elevate you spiritually. Every time you go to the king's table, when you are partaking, chewing, masticating the food, just like when you, every one of us, when we eat, we chew, right? Now, when you chew, the word of God is in the spiritual form, it's called meditating. When you begin to chew the word of God, initially it's just meditating, but there will come a point of time where as you chew, suddenly the word unfolds. Every time when the word unfolds, the lights elevate you. Every time the word unfolds, the lights elevate you. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And only you renew your strength, they say, you shall mount out on wings as eagles. Now we said this before, but I'm going to elaborate a little bit more today. When the Bible says we shall mount on wings as eagles, that means it's not automatically, it is only the elevation comes through revelation. Amen? The more you receive revelation, the more you have elevation. When you have elevation, this is where the realm of the Spirit where you have advantage. That means the, the Bible calls Satan, what is his name? is the prince of the power of the air. Amen? That means this is his terrain. The air represents the spiritual realm. This is a terrain. But when you are like an eagle, martyr on wings as eagle, that means now you have advantage over him in that realm. 
That means when you are elevated higher than the realm of the enemy, which we are. The Bible says we are seated in Him far above every principality, dominion, power. That means even though this is a reality, just like Jesus is our bread, is our living word, is our, 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 our life, the, the Bible says he, that He will come, you have abundant life. But not every Christian lives the abandoned life. Some live the abandoned life. How come? Because while that is true, there must be key to know how to position ourselves to get it. That means I, as you partake the Word of God, every day as the Word of God enters or gives you light, your elevation will put you in a situation where now you have very clear eyesight that you know exactly the schemes of the enemy. The reason why you, the, the enemy has advantage over you because your understanding is darkened. Isn't that what Ephesians 4, 18 says? Because having their understanding darkened. Yeah, when your understanding is darkened, you're alienated from the life of God. That means even though Jesus is in you, but if your understanding is darkened, Ephesians 4, 18 says that that means you'll be alienated from the life of God. Now, it's a very strange philosophy. It's a very strange uh, 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 paradox. That means, while Jesus is in me, I'm in Him. But if my understanding is actually undarkened, I am separated from Him. That is why people feel far from God. Oh, today I don't know why I feel Jesus very far away. No, your understanding is darkened. Alienated from the life of God. Then having the ignorance, right? Because the ignorance that's in you. That means, that means Satan will move and triumph over you, over every ignorance you have. That's why you perish for the lack of knowledge. So when we perish, when we are defeated for the lack of knowledge, we come to the wrong conclusion. What is our conclusion? Oh, the enemy is very powerful. No. The Bible says one day when Satan is exposed, you see, ah, this man, this is the one that terrorizes everybody. This is, this is Satan. It's in the Bible, right? You say when he's exposed, everybody will say, ha, this is a man that terrorized all of us. Alama, we you know, can't cover for nothing. So the reason why the enemy is magnified is because our understanding is darkened and we are alienated from the life of God. When that happens, because of the ignorance and the blindness of our heart, these two conditions, when the ignorance means you're in darkness, you're, when the blindness in your heart, you can't see, the enemy will reign over. So what happens when you come to the king's table? Is so that you can feast. And that when you feast, it's not to blindly eat without understanding, but when you feast, you're supposed to receive light. John 1 4 says that in him was life, or in him was light, and the life was in the light. I can, it can, in fact, you can use interchangeably, and the life was in the light. Both can be used also. He said, in him was life, and life was the light of man. That means where there's life, there's light. Where there's light, there's life. That means every time you receive light, you are receiving life. Amen? So don't underestimate the activity when you come to the king's table. That means every day, no matter how busy you are, don't let the enemy trick and deceive you to stop you from reaching the word of God. I sometimes feel very sad because, you know, sometimes we get so busy that we, we have no time to feed ourselves. And I know it's not because we are lazy, but because we are not wise. I never met anybody who is stricken with kidney problem ever skip dialysis in their life. Never. No matter how busy they are, they'll go to dialysis. If it takes seven hours, six hours, they'll be there six, seven hours. Why? Because it's top priority. But word of God, uh, well, if you have time, <laughs> it's optional. No, guys. I want to encourage you one more time. Wednesday, make it your priority. We serve decent food. Very decent food. Don't skip. Because your wellness depends on all the small things you do. Really. If in fact, in the kingdom of God, he said, give us this day our daily bread. That's all. How difficult it is, give us this day our daily bread. How difficult it is. In the garden of Eden, all Jesus, all the Adam and Eve need to do is choose the right tree. That's it. And yet, they chose the wrong tree. So every day, God says, choose this day. Whether life or death, blessing or curse. Every day, you must make right decisions. 
Whether it's Sunday, whether it's Wednesday, if Wednesday you miss, come on Thursday. We still got online on Thursday. And don't miss it because you need to be fed. If you want to overcome your enemy, you want to live a victorious life, you want to live the abundance life, not the abandoned life, then feed yourself. Make sure you make time for the king's table. Today, the invitation is gone to Mephibosheth, like for us, that you are now to be seated, that you are now to sit at the king's table every day. This is a position not given to even the Old Testament people like Elijah, Elisha, Moses, Abraham, you name it. This privilege has not been given to them. But today, this has been given to us, New Testament believer. Amen? And God said, now you can come and sit at my table, feast at my table. And not only that, when you begin to sit at my table, I will set up a table before your enemy. That means instead of losing appetite, you eat like a vengeance with a vengeance. Anytime you can eat before the enemy, that means not only your appetite is strong, your faith is strong. Amen? When you can eat before your enemy, that means now you're walking in perfect peace. That means you're no longer rattled by the storms around you. It doesn't get to you. It is there outside, but it never gets into your spirit. You may be carrying a physical ailment, but then you find your spirit being protected because you continue to believe that you're seated in the heavenly realm, even though physically I'm currently impeded. But like the, the three Hebrew boys say, if, you know, if the God we serve will save us, if He doesn't save us, so be it. Be careful of the one who can take your body but cannot steal your soul. But careful of the person that can steal or kill your body and kill your soul. Isn't that what we last we went through last, last Sunday? Matthew 10, 28. That means God is saying that on earth, the physical body is very important. But let me tell you, the one who has got eternal value is your soul. That means don't put too much attention to your body and neglect your soul. Yeah? Uh, Matthew 10, 28. So he says that be careful. He says there's one that can steal your body. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That means Jesus is saying, don't only look after your body in your lifetime, but pay attention to your soul. Because this is where the contention is. This is where the enemy and God is both contending for this portion of this entity called the soul. And so when you partake of the bread, this bread is to fortify your soul. This bread is supposed to strengthen your soul, which is your mind, your emotion, and your will. That means there's no way... So listen to this. Ooh, in case I get ahead of myself. For those of you who want to do the will of God, let me tell you something. You cannot do the will of God unless actually you've been feeding the Word of God into your soul. Because the will of God, in order to do the few will of God, there must be the desire... Can we go back to uh, Matthew 16, 24? I didn't give this to you. But Matthew 16, 24, said, and Jesus said to his disciples, if you want to follow me, right? Or the Filipinos say, if you want to follow me, right? If you want to follow me, you must take up the cross, right? Deny himself, take up the cross. Let me tell you something. There's no way you can deny yourself and take up the cross if you have not been partaking at his bread in this table daily. Impossible. Whatever, if you ever, um, whatever if you're doing that, it seems like this, it is called mimicking. That means you're only doing what you're taught. That means you're only trying to live the crucified life. But I can tell you, it's not sustainable. You do halfway, you will give up. And then it's too difficult. It's ah, so tough to follow Jesus. Let me tell you something. To give this stage, you have already grown spiritually. To get to this stage, this is almost the apex of your spiritual life already. That means this is a volunteer thing. See, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny. See, that means this is a person who is not forced to deny themselves. But many Christians feel that they are forced to deny themselves. They are, they are coerced to take up the cross. If you are in this position, you are doing the right thing but in the wrong spirit. And anything you do in the, in the kingdom of God with the right thing but wrong spirit is discounted. That means you can only do this if you have been feeding yourself spiritually, that means to the point where not only you take up the cross, actually you embrace the cross. That's why Paul said, I consider all things junk. Can we go to Philippians 3, 7 to 9? Paul says, I consider everything, whatever that was gained to me, I consider loss. How come Paul can come to this conclusion? How can he come to this position? He said that I, what things were gained to me, this I counted loss. For who? For Christ. He said, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ Jesus my Lord, 
for whom I suffered the loss of all things, count them as rubbish or some version, count them as dung, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. That I may gain Christ. That means if you never thought gaining Christ is far more important than anything in the world, there's no way you can take up the cross. Can I repeat one more time? If you have not got to this point of growth and, growth and knowledge, that Christ, actually gaining Christ, beat the heck of anything in the world. That means not theologically, not theoretically, but in reality, you saw the preciousness of Christ. There's no way you pick up the cross. In fact, if you pick up the cross, it's just mimicking on it. Just, you know, you are being encouraged too. So you try. You do it on your own strength. You last probably about three weeks, three months, one year. And after that, you probably give up. I say, it's so tough. Some people, when they do that in their flesh, in fact, they never come back to church after that. Yeah, because they're so discouraged. They say, oh, it's so tough. Every day is lamentation. Every day for them is lamentation. You know, taking up the cross. They tell the whole world they're taking up the cross. And they do it in such a spirit of, of reluctance. They do a spirit of, of, what's the word for it? Uh, in agony. Every day is, uh, you know, the Chinese call Han Chin Bang face. You know, they, they, every day, <laughs> they just, you know, they have this horse face. Like, you know, horse face, right? You know, everybody know. If you are carrying the cross in the spirit to begin with, you're doing it the wrong way. Let me tell you something. The right person, the mature person, the person who has grown to the right position, when they embrace the cross, this is almost a relationship between them and God. That means when, when, you, when God becomes your lover, there are things that you quietly do for your spouse that nobody will know. Amen. That's why when your relationship, when you don't have the maturity, and then when you are being forced or you have been wrongly instructed to pick up the cross, when you barely can even locate the cross, <laughs> you will last for three weeks. And sometimes if you last for one year, you never come back to the church because you'll be so disappointed, you'll be so such a painful process that you'll never forget that you will injure yourself spiritually. Some people never come back to the church. That means you are touching something that is beyond your current position. You, it's beyond your pay grade. And then when you suffer a repercussion, you all, in fact, when you do it the wrong way, it's like, you know, when you do certain things wrongly, you can injure yourself. Just like weight. If you carry weight the wrong way, you, you're going to hurt yourself, right? Either you're going to hurt your, your bones, you're going to hurt your muscle, you're going to tear your muscle because you do it wrongly, not under supervision. That's why it's, it's impossible. If you can't bench press 50 kg, you try 250, it's crazy. Taking up the cross is like taking up the cross is like doing 250. When you can't even do 50 bench press, you do 250. Unless you're Anatole, you know. Hey, brother, can you can do, you can do. <laughs> right? You're going to enjoy yourself. And, and that's why some people, after they enjoy themselves, they never come back to the gym anymore. Just like some people, when they do something, try something that's beyond their depth, they'll be so hurt and injured. They'll be so disoriented, they'll never come back. So let me very quickly come back before we close. Why is it important for us to come to the table every day? It is very important. Because unless you come to the table every day, you do not eat of the spiritual food that can actually give you the, what we call the bulwark, the defense, the 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 the, the what do you call that? The, the the firepower that you need to see the schemes of the enemy. What does the coming to the table do? One of the things is that when you eat the bread of God, you open your eyes so that you become unaware of the schemes of the enemy. That's all you need to do. That means when you see the schemes of the enemy, instead of being angry with somebody you know there is a spirit behind this person that's stirring up anger towards this person. So you remain loving. So instead of having unforgiveness, instead of having fits of anger, instead of reacting violently, right? you find yourself sitting at the table. No problem. You continue eating. Before the Lord Jesus went to the cross the night before he set up a table for his disciples. That means before his most agonizing work on earth, the night before he actually had his meal before he went to Gethsemane. A lot of us skip the table, we went straight to Gethsemane and intercede. No, no, no. The, the order must be correct. First, come to the table. So it's not in a hurry. By the way, 
the Hebrew word for come to the table, the table there is called the royal table, the king's table. That means this is a table that's done purposefully, not in a haste. It is done with finesse. It is done so that everything can be provided for. That means this is not a table that's set up hastily. That means even though Jesus was going to face his worst day of his life, what he said at the table was not in a hurry. In fact, he even had time to wash the feet of the disciples. He took his time because this is the symbol. This is the way a royalty carry himself. That means he knows. Even the uh, they, they, say, they say it's better to die like a lion than try to live. No, no. It's better than uh, a dead lion has got more glory than a, a live dog. That means even though Jesus was to be crucified, he took it. His, he took every step in a royal fashion. And this actually tells us how we should live our life. That means when things are surrounding us, when it's cooking, when the heat is increasing, you remain unfaced. Why? Because every day you've been eating at the king's table. So the day when you face your enemy, you are already strong. You no longer, you, you, you don't only, but most people, they only go to the king's table when emergency. <laughs> right? And then by the time emergency, you got, it's too late to eat already. But by then, you try to build up your speeches, it's too late already. Every prayer is a prayer out of desperation, not out of faith. So your day, the days when there's peace, is the day where you accumulate yourself. That means every army in the world has to train themselves where it's peace time. And that said, that said, as we know today, that we read the latest news that Iran has fired first incursion directly into Israel. And this is something that we should pray for also. Because this can escalate big time. Yeah. So that means if you don't prepare yourself during peace time, when the time the enemy is at your gate, it's too late. So your daily, come to the table daily, is where you begin to feed yourself. As you begin to feed yourself, God elevates you. Guys, listen to this. The more you're elevated, the more you remain unfaced. Because you know why? Because you see every scheme that the enemy is doing against you. That means usually when Satan wants to disrupt you, to get you out of Ephesians 2.6, he just sends somebody to irritate you. Either your parents will come and irritate you, or your spouse will come and irritate you, or your colleague will come and irritate you. Anybody can be used as a weapon. Just like sometimes you are being used as a weapon just that you do not know. You are used to irritate other people also. Yeah, when other people irritate you, you know. When you irritate other people, you don't know. It takes revelation also in case you do not know. Yeah, hey, yes. Absolutely. I pray that as much as God will open our eyes to see the scheme of the enemy, God will open your eyes to see that you are being part of his schemes. Most of the time when you're part of the devil's scheme, you have no idea. And part of the way God opened our eyes is so that we know that we do not become a weapon used by the enemy. That's why when Jesus said, love your enemy, not because it is an unfair system, not because God said, huh, despite how he treat me, I am supposed to love him. This is not fair. No, it's not whether fair. This is wise. That means you are no at any point of time being weaponized by the enemy to create more chaos and to perpetrate darkness. Every time you exercise unforgiveness, you perpetrate darkness. Every time you retaliate, you know, an eye for an eye, you perpetrate darkness. You are building a culture of the kingdom of God even though you are a believer. In fact, to be honest, most of the time, we become a weapon for the kingdom of darkness than actually an instrument for the kingdom of light. Because most of the time, we are moving carnally. So when people hit me one time, I retaliate. If people do this to me, I respond it back. I make sure I give you the right response. How can I be nice to the person when they never treat me nicely? You know. So we argue because we are calculating in carnally minded. But Jesus said, if you love those who love you, then, then what, what is your credit? He said, even the sinners do that. What's the big deal about your love? He said, even the non-believer do that. You only love those who love you. So, so all this teaching... It is only possible. That means when all this is happening in your life, you know how you live the blessed life? is when you are untouched by the system of the world. Instead of retaliation, you are resting. Instead of, instead of giving an eye for an eye, you are eating, feasting on the word of God. Instead of getting yourself out of the position of rest and stress every day that you have sleepless night, where you're insomnia, 
you are sleeping peacefully because why? You have found your peace in the Lord. You never read because why? You stay in Ephesians 2 6 consistently. That means to stay in Ephesians 2 6 means you never respond in a natural way. You always, because you see the scheme of the enemy, you are always seated in Ephesians 2 6. And what does that mean? Let me conclude. When you are always seated in Ephesians 2 6, means you're always walking in full peace. In fact, the nine fruits of the Spirit will begin to manifest in your life. That means even though when you're going through suffering, instead of complaining, instead of you know, getting offended by God, you find yourself just letting God do His work because you trust the work of your Father. You know that He's maturing you. He is growing roots in you. You know when... Can we go to Jeremiah chapter 17? Uh, I think it's verse 7. Jeremiah chapter... 17 verse 7, yes. I think so, yes. Is it okay? 7 and 8 and 9, I think. Blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. Yeah? And what will happen when he trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord? He said, For he shall be like a tree planted by the water who spread out his roots by the river. He will not fear when heat comes, but his leaves will be green. He will not be anxious in the year of drought and now will cease. From yielding fruit. That means when the drought comes, when everything in your life goes wrong, when nothing is working for you, when everything looks dead, guess what? Your roots go deep within and you survive and you thrive and you still continue to bear fruit. If this is an exciting picture, please say amen. That means this is your portion. This is the abundant life. This is the overcoming life. That means even a drought cannot kill you. Because you have resources. Because when you eat at the king's table, you are growing your roots so deeply that even in time of drought, you are not only surviving, you continue to yield fruit. This is the result of coming to the king's table, making time for the king's table every day. But you only go to the king's table in emergency. Just like you only see your MP when you have a problem. Then Susala. Right? People, don't, please don't treat Jesus like your MP. A lot of us treat Jesus like MP. We only see him when you've got a problem. <laughs> you know what? But that happened. That's why we always need prayer. That's why we always, you know, we are always looking for solution. Like I say, please don't stop asking for prayer. We are more than happy to pray for you. But beyond asking for prayer, we want to help you to survive in the time of drought. Amen? We want to teach you to be like a tree where even in the time of drought, you can still use fruit. That's why people are amazed by your testimony. They say, how can this person still have joy when everything is going wrong? How can this person have full peace when everything is, you know, hating is against him? How can this person is still walking in love when everything around him, you know, is against him despite what is happening to him? Because you be an enigma to people. But Christian is behaving exactly opposite. So Christian growth, your growth is not the ministry that you do. It's not the ministry that we serve. The kingdom of God is not growing by working. The kingdom of God advanced by us growing spiritually. Amen? That means if you are not growing spiritually, the only indication of your spiritual aliveness is church attendance, you are in trouble. That means if every week you come here and you walk out the same, that means the church is dead, just that they do not know. With all due respect. That means if you're not growing spiritually, that means if you are the same position as you are in 2019, and today is still the same, 2015 is still the same, technically you're dead, just that you do not know. In the realm of the Spirit, it takes revelation even to know that you're dead. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yep, a lot of people don't know they're dead. They, because why every week they still go to church. But you're dead. You are stop growing. In the, in, the king, in the realm of the Spirit, if you stop growing, technically it's three, six months, you're dead. You, you're dead already. It's just that physically you're still moving. So you think you're alive. This is what is alive. That means when there's no drought, eh, so when there's no water, in the time of drought, you say when the heat comes, you will not fear. It leaves will still be green. That means that everything is against you. People hurt you. People wound you. You're still green. People come against you. They do all kinds of evil things to you. 
you still bring fruits. That's why God said, rejoice, be exceedingly glad when you are persecuted, when people revile you for His sake, when people do evil, speak evil things because of Christ. In Matthew 5, 13, He said, rejoice, be exceedingly glad. That's why people don't understand this instruction. They think Jesus is crazy. No, He's not crazy. He's telling you He, he, he just hits jackpot. Because when you can rejoice, when you are in this position, oh, sorry, uh, reverse, uh, 11 and 12, I think. Yeah. And, and when you're in this position, God say rejoice and be exceedingly glad because you just hit jackpot. He say because blessed are, are you when people, re, when they revert, persecute, say all kinds of evil things against you falsely for, is rejoice and be exceeding. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. This is a state, this is a state that's only possible if every day you're eating at the king's table. So let me find a closing. That means don't make coming to the king's table a, an act of emergency. That means don't come and visit Jesus like an MP. Oh, you know, my house got problem. My tenant give me a headache, you know, so I need to activate my MP to settle this issue. Right, my estate has got this problem, so I need to see my MP to settle. If you make Jesus your MP, that means you only visit emergency. You, in the time of drought, you will, first, first plant to die will be you. First tree to go bota will be you. First tree to mampos will be you. Because why? You have never planted yourself. Your roots have never grown deep. But to eat at a king's table, that means every day you are fortifying yourself spiritually. That you got so you have such a reserve that in times of drought, you are not only you survive, you are still bearing fruits. That when people stab you, you are still walking in peace. When people do all kinds of evil things toward you, you maintain a healthy posture. You are still walking in joy. This is not acting, guys. This is called fruits. Amen. So you can only we can only bear fruits when you eat in the king's table. So I want to invite you every day to come to the king's table. There's an old song, I think, sung by Don Moan. It says, come to the table. Right? Where, where, what? Yeah, anyway, you know, it's a pretty, a pretty meaning, meaningful song. But it's an old song by Don Moan, talk about coming to the table. Where, you know, where everything that you have received in your life that's bad, but you come to the king's table, you find life. Amen. I pray that every day, you put priority for the king's table. That means don't do it only when you have time. Make time for the king's table. When you do it when you only when you have time, you will never have time. But when you make time for the king's table, there will always be time. Let's stand. Hi guys, I uh, hope that you are, thank you for listening to the messages that you have been checking in. And I pray that all those messages that you listen, that you will take time to like and subscribe. And if they have any comment, I would love to hear from you. If you learn anything from the message, I hope that you can share your comment. And I believe that this is a message that's preparing. All the messages that we preach are preparing the church for the return of the King. And I believe this is a timely message going forward. And so I pray that you continue to tune in and also to take time to share and subscribe. God bless you.